the first office that I went to work for, well, I went to, I always remember the number, yes. 19 different offices and was turned down. Mm -hmm. And uh, I finally got a job in a, like the 20th office. I found that from co-workers, some of them were very pleased that here I was a licensed architect, and others were angry about it. Good evening, and welcome to the second episode into the Mosaic series that this year we're, work, we're featuring the arts communities in Santa Monica. Mosaic is a joint production between the Santa Monica Conservancy and the Santa Monica History Museum. Tonight, we'd like to thank our 2024 sponsor, BXP Boston Properties, for their help in making this program possible. Tonight, we meet four African-American architects who bravely broke racial and gender barriers to enhance lives and landscapes across a range of cultures and communities. These include Vernon Brunson, James Garrett, Norma Sklarik, and Paul Williams. Although their work often spanned the globe, each was centered in Los Angeles and had creative connections with the Santa Monica Bay Area. From the LAX theme building to the Pacific Design Center to the first AME Church and Nickerson Gardens, these visionaries attracted high level clients with often bold modern styles, but they never forgot their roots, bringing new accessibility and a better life to underserved communities through functional designs. Our featured architects also extended their legacy to the next generation of African-Americans and men and women of color to enter the mostly white and male field of architecture. Although we're focusing on our four select African-Americans, we'd like to acknowledge three others who also helped shape mid-century modernism in Los Angeles. They include Robert Kennard, Roy Seeley, and Ralph Vaughn. We have assembled a panel of experts representing a variety of perspectives to tell the story of our featured architects. The program will conclude, con conclude as usual with a Q&A where you, the members of the audience, can ask your questions to the panel by using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. I'd also like to draw attention to the closed caption button at the bottom of your screen if you so, if you so need, need to use it. We begin with Carolyn Edwards and Anne Wallentine, who, who introduces us to Santa Monica's own Vernon Brunson, an enterprising writer, engineer, and architect whose quest for equality was at the core of his creativity. Carolyn is a board member of the Santa Monica Conservancy, and she's founder and director of the Quinn Research Center, an educational resource for Black culture in the Santa Monica area. Anne is collections manager and curator at the Santa Monica History Museum. 
I'd like to remind you that right now, the museum is featuring the life and work of Vernon Brunson at its facility, which if you remember is at the uh, back of the Santa Monica Public Library on 7th Street. Carolyn, please welcome to the program. Thank you, Libby, and good evening and welcome to each of you. I'm Carolyn Edwards, director and co-founder of the Quinn Research Center with my husband, Bill. I have the pleasure of speaking you, to you this evening about the personal life of Vernon Emanuel Brunson, a building designer, engineer, and leading community member in Santa Monica. I personally remember Mr. Brunson from my childhood, where we all resided in the Pico neighborhood community. I was friends with two of his daughters and always enjoyed going to their home located at 19th and Pico. There were so many interesting items to see, such as his office, which was, by the way, off limits, but the door was usually open. I could see his drafting table, along with many, many pencils and rulers. There was also a piano and a guitar, both of which he knew how to play. At the time, I didn't realize what an important role he had in the community. Mr. Brunson was the second son of Selena and Charles Brunson, who came to Santa Monica as part of the Great Migration in the early 1900s. Their older son, Donald, was the first black child born in the city. These photos of the young family show how well established they had become in the city of Santa Monica. Their mother, Selena, encouraged her sons to continue their education any way that they could. And Charles was an early advocate for civil rights. Both brothers enrolled in many correspondence classes. Vernon especially enjoyed learning about photography, writing, music, and aerodynamics. I'm sure that's why he had so many talents, as you will see in the, the following images. Mr. Brunson was very creative. He wrote poetry and a regular column about Santa Monica events and global affairs for the California Eagle, a leading black newspaper. He even developed an early version of today's selfie photos. As you can see in these photos, he figured out how to tie a string to a shutter to take photos of himself and his friends. Mr. Brunson married Amanda Blanks, who was a Mexican American. Their courtship got off to a rocky start when she pretended not to understand English during their first meeting at church. But Vernon quickly learned Spanish and they became a wonderful couple. They married and had four children together. Amanda served as an informer, informal translator and midwife for local families in their neighborhood, while Mr. Brunson worked at Hughes Aircraft in Culver City. Family was very important to him. The day would begin in the kitchen that he designed with a cup of his favorite, Holder's Coffee, along with a story while packing his lunch before heading off to work. Dinner time was equally important, sharing stories of the day and quite possibly making plans for the next local Christmas decorating contest, a family tradition. Mr. Brunson previously won a local decorating contest and created a sketch for a proposed street decor, which is preserved in the museum's collection. Because he spent quality time with his children, they were inspired by his talents, such as one daughter became a fashion designer and another designed her own family home in Mississippi. 
Though Mr. Brunson was passionately interested in aviation, he was turned away from flight training because of racism. He wrote about this experience in a letter to the Black Wings, a Black aviators group founded by William J. Powell. Mr. Brunson later founded a Santa Monica branch of the club and continued to pursue his interest in aviation through his work at Hughes and his imaginative space age inspired designs. Because he was highly regarded in the Santa Monica community, he was sought after to design many structures, one of which was the Philomathian Clubhouse, recently awarded landmark status here in Santa Monica. The Philomathian Club was founded in 1921 by seven African-American women in the city of Santa Monica as a charitable organization. It continues to thrive after 103 years, still providing charitable acts, as well as providing yearly academic scholarships. After many years, I have remained close to the Brunson siblings, and it was such a pleasure to reconnect with them to share these wonderful memories of a great man and highly respected in Santa Monica. And now I would like to turn this segment over to Anne Wallentine from the, city, the, the Santa Monica History Museum, and she will share information about some of his designs. Thank you so much, Carolyn. Um, I'm happy to talk a little bit about Vernon Brunson's uh, architecture, especially around Santa Monica. Um, in addition to the design for the now landmarked Philomathian Club that Carolyn mentioned, uh, Vernon Brunson also drafted plans for a number of black churches around Santa Monica, Venice, and as far away as Lancaster. Uh, several of these were not built to plan, but we do know that he designed the frontage of First AME Church in Santa Monica, uh, where he sang in the choir and met his wife, Amanda. Uh, Mr. Brunson also designed the education center for Calvary Baptist Church on Broadway which you can see to the left of this image and, and now here, this full image. Um, his building plans tend to be simple, functional, and rectilinear. It's a kind of everyday vernacular. Um, and you can see uh, the, the sort of influence of his uh, work at Hughes Aviation, as Carolyn mentioned, for some of his designs. Um, he worked as an electromechanical designer at Hughes Aviation for two decades. Um, and designing these buildings and additions was his second job. Many community members came to him for designs, um, and he built a reputation for draftsmanship while working with several local contractors. Uh, while Mr. Br Mr. Brunson's design for First Baptist Church, which is pictured here, was not actually built, the plans also show Mr. Brunson's interest in mixing different architectural styles and influences. These proposed additions included a somewhat neoclassical style forecourt for the church with pillars and a small pediment, but also mission tile for the roof, which is just interesting to, to come across. Mr. Brunson also drafted plans for many local businesses, including several storefronts for local businesswoman Essie Tucker and the frontage of the Salvation Army. This billiard shop design you can see here was for Antonio Munoz and it reworked a multi-store strip at the corner of Rose Avenue in Venice. Most of Mr. Brunson's addition or renovation designs were also pretty straightforward and, and functional. As an engineer, he used his training to also create uh, barbecue pits for several local barbecue restaurants, some of which used to be on Main Street. Mr. Brunson also designed his own home, as Carolyn mentioned, uh, this boxy kind of spacious building at 2024 19th Street, which he shared with his wife, Amanda, and their four children. He eventually added an apartment complex to the back of the lot as well for additional income. His daughters recall a study as a place of intense thought and creativity where he designed and drew up all these plans for his clients, wrote, and even painted as well. Uh, we also have the building permit and plans for Mr. Brunson's home, which he continued revising and adding to over many years. Uh, the museum received, received about 100 of Mr. Brunson's plans and sketches from his granddaughter, which are now housed in our archive. 
In 2021, uh, the Brunson home was demolished to uh, build the Brunson Terrace, an affordable housing complex that stands on the site today, pictured here. Most of the existing plans that the, in our collection are for residential additions or renovations, including adding garages, apartment units, or rumpus rooms that accommodated growing families in Santa Monica. Additional apartment units added to lots also allowed working and middle-class families to supplement their income. It seems from the plans that many of Mr. Brunson's clients were from his local community, including friends and neighbors, but the plans also include locations across the west side in Los Angeles. So you can kind of trace the, the networks of, uh, of the city as well through the, the designs he was drawing. Uh, he also designed for clients of all races, one garage addition he drew was for the home of Leo Bourget, one of the founders of Bourget Brothers Building Materials and the predominantly white neighborhood of the Pacific Palisades. Uh, with his work in the aviation industry, Mr. Brunson was highly attuned to the progress and style of the jet age. The technological and social shifts caused by air travel influenced a lot of modern architecture, including the geometric googie style and the streamlined modern uh, the aer aerodynamic shapes of street, streamlined modern. Uh, while Mr. Brunson's work remained, mo remained mostly grounded in everyday practicalities, um, his position also allowed him to kind of think about the, these visions of the future and apply them in his creative imaginings, like the space house that was shown earlier um, during Carolyn's talk, as well as this class assignment for a futuristic city of tomorrow. You can see how the, the curvilinear shapes of this building are reminiscent of the, um, of the theme building at LAX designed by Paul Williams as part of an architectural team. Uh, Santa Monica City Hall was built in 1939 and designed by Parkinson and Estep. Uh, its style is called PWA Modern, mi mixing Art Deco and modern influences. Um, but the year before this, Mr. Brunson proposed his own design for the City Hall in a public competition that was hosted by the Junior Chamber of Commerce and the Evening Outlook. He received third place for his drawing, which is pictured here on the left, alongside the clipping about the winning entrance. Mr. Brunson's interest in civic design continued throughout his life. He was involved in city planning as a member of the Architectural Review Board in the 1970s, and he contributed to the design of City Hall's disability ramps as well. Uh, lastly, I wanted to just share this signature of Mr. Brunson's initials, VEB, which we found on several of his uh, plans and designs as, as his sign off. Um, you can see the winged V in the center is flanked by his middle and last initials. And I just appreciate that it reflects both his personal style as well as a little bit of his aviation interests and his dreams of flight. Uh, while Mr. Brunson's body of work mainly focused on practical vernacular architecture, everyday additions and renovations, it's also wonderful to be able to see his flights of imagination and creative uh, space age drawings. Uh, he, his wide ranging talents and achievements inspired many others in his community and his plans and writings show how much more he envisioned for the future. Thank you so much. I'd like to hand it back over to Libby. My thanks to both Carolyn and Anne for introducing us to a more thorough understanding of uh, Vernon Brunson and his work. And we're, we're ready to go and take a look at the, at the exhibition at the museum. And now we turn our segment to Norma Scleric, a world-class designer who resided in Pacific Palisades for most of her later life. She was the first black woman to be licensed in California. And she was the first to join the prestigious American Institute of Architecture. She was also, another first, the first female vice president and director of the prominent LA firm Gruen and Associates. There, she was part of the design team on such landmark projects as the Pacific Design Center and Terminal One at LAX. Telling us about the amazing story of Norma, we introduce Ronald Wiley, who knew her as a, a mentor and a friend. Ronald is the founder and principal of Raw International, a community-focused architectural firm in Los Angeles. He is widely recognized for his commitment to cultural preservation of underserved urban communities. Welcome to the program, Ronald. 
Well, thank you, Libby. Um, I'll help you to get a couple of things straight. It's Roland Wiley. And uh, I just wanna welcome all of you to uh, this really interesting and important program. I'm gonna talk about Norma Scleric. And uh, as a fellow architect, I wanna acknowledge first that architecture is a difficult profession for anyone. And with Norma Merrick Scleric, you add gender bias, racial prejudice, and challenges of being a single mom to that. Uh, next slide, please. Norma is a, has many titles. Uh, they have called her the Rosa Parks of architecture. Uh, they've called her a trailblazer. Uh, they've called her the architect of many firsts and uh, an unprecedented black female architect. Uh, I believe she was an unsung civil rights le leader. Uh, she, she's, I was honored and privileged to be, for her to be my boss. She was my first boss out of school. I had no idea who she is and who she was at that time, but I certainly found out. Next. Now, if we were to, if Norma were here listening to what we were saying, she would have a polite smile uh, about all of these firsts, the, the first uh, black female architect registered in LA and California and New York, and uh, the first to be a fellow of the AIA. Um, she's quoted as saying, I am not proud to be a unique statistic, but embarrassed by our system, which has caused my dubious distinction. Just to give you a little background on Norma's history, she was born in 1928 in Harlem, New York. She grew up in Brooklyn. Her dad was a, a physician and her mom was a seamstress. She graduated from Columbia University in 1950 and became licensed in 1954. She worked in New York for, for Skidmore, Owens and Merrill for about five years. And then she joined Gruen Associates. She moved from LA to um, move from New York to Los Angeles in 1960. And um, she, she, she was first, uh, that was the foundation at Gruen was the foundation of her career as an architect. Next. Norma quickly rose uh, to success at Gruen. Uh, and in a unique collaboration in the, in the 60s and 70s with Cesar Pellet, where this is the San Bernardino City Hall that was built in 1973. But as the director of architecture, she, she hired people. She hired and fired people. Can you imagine that? Gruen at that time was a firm of maybe about 75 to 100 people, mostly predominantly white males. And she was the director over them, which is, which is phenomenal in, in and of itself. She, she was gifted. She had an extraordinary gift to put complex, large scale, iconic buildings together. Next. This is the uh, Tokyo Embassy, uh, which was built in 1976, another collaboration with Caesar Pelli. And she was given design credit on this. And she led Norma, that was her, her special talent to, to put great teams together and deliver these impeccable buildings, thoroughly detailed and very well executed in the construction documents. And about the, the, the design credit, uh, Norma, I talked to her son, David Merriweather, and, and he, he told me that she said that she doesn't lead the design, but she brings it to life. And that's, that's very important to, to recognize. Next. This is the Commons project in Columbus, Indiana, another collaboration with Cesar Pelli. This project personally connected with me because I went to Ball State University in Muncie, Indiana, and we went on a field trip. And I was thoroughly impressed with this whole concept of enclosing an outdoor space was enclosed in a glass building in downtown. And that inspired me to, this is what activates a, a dying downtown was something this unique and innovative. And it was developed, the concept just was developed at Gruen. And, and it inspired me for my thesis project. I call it the Fort Wayne City Center. Next. Now, particularly 
the, the Pacific Design Center to me was one of the most, is one of the most significant buildings in Los Angeles. Again, a collaboration with Cesar Pelli completed in 1975. Uh, this project has a very strong connection uh, with me as well. We described Norma as a door opener. Well, she opened the door for me to work on this project uh, back in, in 1980. Uh, I can't believe that it was only one year that I was with Norma at Bruin because she left in 1980. It seemed like the entire five years, but she opened the door with, for me to work on this project and to be the architect in charge of all of the interior renovations for this project. She opened that door by introducing me to the partner in charge, Alan Rubenstein. And she could have chosen a, amongst 50 people, but she chose me and I will be forever grateful for that because the Pacific Design Center ended up becoming my first client when I started my firm in 1984. Next. Norma said architecture should be working on improving the environment of people in their homes, in their places of work and in their places of recreation. It should be functional and pleasant not just the image of the architect's ego. Norma was the architect's architect. She trained generations of architects to become licensed. She modeled excellence. She opened doors. I keep talking about door open doors, another door open, door opening story. Young Japanese man, just starting out of college, got married, the firm he worked for wasn't paying him. He had to quit and he had no other place to go. He just happened to ask his mom, does she know anything? And she said, well, there's an architect lived across the street from her. My, the, the, the gentleman went to talk to this man and he happened to work for Gruen. He called, the young man called uh, Norma Scleric. She said, I don't have any jobs. He said, well, will you just let me interview and show my resume? She said, yes. She didn't know him from Adam and she agreed to interview him with no jobs. Well, today, that man is now the managing partner of Gruen, Michael Inamoto. And that's who Norma was. That's the type of person she was. Next. Now, Norma stayed at Gruen for 20 years. Uh, she left again in 1980 uh, to, because she had an opportunity to become a vice president. She was the director of architecture at Gruen. And she had an opportunity to be a vice president and so she took that opportunity at Welton Beckett Associates, and she led the design of the Terminal One expansion at LAX, which was, had to be completed for the 1984 Olympics, and it was successfully completed. Next. Norma was, was at Welton Beckett from 1980 to 1984, in 1985, and in 1985, she decided to strike out on her own, and she started an architectural firm with uh, Margo Siegel, Siegel and Kate Diamond called Siegel's Cleric and Diamond. Uh, it was the largest female owned architectural firm in the country. And it was a small firm, although it was the largest, it was a small firm and Norma experienced the challenges of running a small firm. As I well know, small firm projects are very demanding and you have to manage them at multiple times. And that can be very challenging. And so uh, she was uh, with Siegel Sclera Diamond until 1989. At that time, she went back to the big projects. She, uh, she then joined uh, the John Jurdy Partnership and she was the, the executive architect for the Mall of America in Minneapolis, Minnesota, the largest mall in, in the US and in the Western hemisphere. Uh, she was there until 19, from 1989 to 1992 and she retired. Next. Upon, upon her retirement, Norma received plenty of accolades. Uh, this is a resolution from the California State Legislator in 2007. She was an honorary member of Delta Sigma Theta in 1998, and she also was awarded the AIA Whitney Young Award in 2008. Next. Now for me, this is the most telling photograph of Norma Scleric. Um, she had range, that's how I describe Norma. She commanded respect. Uh, she commanded, people listened to her because she was so knowledgeable and so discerning. At the same time, she had this gentle grace 
about her. And I, I remember this this scene, I could see at Gruen when I was there, I was like, you know, draftsman. And the, the partners would have lunch in the cafeteria. And um, I would look in and see him in the white china and the nice food. And Norma would be there holding court. And it just, this photograph shows the kind of engaging person Norma was and, and how knowledgeable she was. But at the same time, she was very friendly. I mean, she had this range from, on, at some lunchtime, uh, she would be chatting with Bunny Wilson, uh, Bunny Hayes, who was uh, a friend of mine. And they would just be, chopping it up like like sisters and i look and i say one minute she's in this boardroom holding court with all of these these pulled up white men and then the next minute she's she's hanging out with with bunny hayes and i just found that just incredible to, to have a, such a talented uh woman that has that kind of range next when i talk about range um I really do mean that kind of range. Norma was tough and tenacious. At the same time, she was charming and refined. Uh, she had a, she was so multi-talented that she had a garden party every year in the Pacific Palisades and she invited me to it. And from that time on, we became, we went from, uh, she was my boss to now we're friends. And, uh, she, she was a horticulturalist. You come to her house, she made all the food. She had tapestries hanging on the wall that she made. I was just blown away with the, the multi-talent that Norma possessed. And this, this is an epiphyllum flower that you see. And it's, a, it's really a metaphor of Norma, where it, the, 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 the epiphyllum is, has this tough cactus it grows out of. And Norma was tough and tenacious. And then that beautiful flower represents Norma, charming and refined. And I just want to say thank you, Norma. You have been a tremendous benefit to me and so many others, architects who become licensed and uh, who have thrived because you opened the door for us. So thank you, Norma. Back to you, Libby. Thank you, Roland. Roland. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> now it's time to meet our next pioneer, James Garrett, who designed several buildings in our area and for a time during World War II, worked for the Douglas Aircraft in Santa Monica. Over the course of his 40 year career, Garrett designed more than 200 buildings, a number in the mid-century modernist style. He was the second black architect to join the American Institute of Architects. Presenting our segment on James Garrett tonight will be Dr. Tony Denzer, a professor of architectural engineering at the University of New Mexico, of, of Wyoming. Uh, upon earning his PhD from UCLA, he taught for a while at Woodbury University in Los Angeles. Tony's books include a study of architect activist Gregory Ain called The Modern Home as Social Commentary. Ayn partnered with Garrett in a Silver Lake architectural firm specializing in modernist designs. Please welcome Dr. Tony Denser. Thank you, Libby. I am pleased uh, that you're all joining us tonight and, and have an interest in this subject. And I'm uh, pleased to tell you a, a little bit about James Homer Garrett Jr., certainly a groundbreaker. He was called Jimmy, and he and unlike the previous presenters, I didn't know him personally myself, but um, uh, happy to to share what I know about him. He was the second African American architect to become licensed in the state of California, and the first was Paul Williams. You'll hear more about him in a few minutes. Garrett worked in Los Angeles from the 1920s to the 70s, and was apparently quite prolific, although we don't really have a complete understanding of his career. We don't have a complete list of his projects. For example, he said he designed 200 houses, but um, only about a dozen are specifically uh, documented. He said he designed 25 churches. I only know of four or five. And according to one writer in the 1950s, 
he had designed numerous schools, but I have not been able to find any of them. Um, so future discoveries to be made. And although there are only a, uh, a few uh, photos of Garrett uh, in circulation as well, I found a new one and I'll share it with you in, in a few minutes. It's amazing to consider from the beginning that Garrett was essentially self-taught. He earned his architect's license by examination in 1928, never having attended college or uh, worked for an architect. He got a good dose of drafting and construction technology in high school at Los Angeles Polytechnic. And I think uh, that was a rather amazing place. Um, and then he cut his teeth making drawings for a construction company. Next slide, please. Garrett's first major building, 1928, the Golden State Mutual Life Insurance Company, uh, using the Spanish revival style that was so popular at the time. Again, I think it's just remarkable that he could work so confidently in this style. He was simply uh, just very talented and very intelligent. Golden State Mutual was a really significant institution in, in the Black community in Los Angeles. It was Black-owned, located on Central Avenue, um, and now listed on the National Register of Historic Places. The owners of the company considered hiring Paul Williams, but gave the commission to Garrett because they believed he was, quote, hungrier. They did hire Williams for a larger building in uh, West Adams in 1949. And the vice president of the company, George Beavers Jr., hired Garrett to design a house uh, for himself nearby. Next slide. On the left, Garrett, in fact, partnered with Paul Williams here to build uh, the St. Philip's Episcopal Church in South Central, 1929. And then on the right, working alone, uh, Garrett designed the Mount Zion Baptist Church, 1936. So these are Depression era structures and both major uh, institutions in the history of the, the African American community uh, in Los Angeles. Next slide. Garrett built these two houses in the Silver Lake neighborhood in 1940. Uh, on the right, his own house. Uh, and he was unmarried at this time. So this was for himself, his mother, and his brother. Then on the left, uh, a very significant client, Lauren Miller, the eminent civil rights attorney who fought against race-restricted housing covenants. Miller argued the uh, landmark 1948 case of Shelley v. Kramer in front of the U.S. Supreme Court where they ruled covenants to be unconstitutional. Uh, also in the 1950s, Miller owned L.A.'s black newspaper, the California Eagle, and in the 60s became a superior court judge. <clears throat> so Judge Miller and, and Jimmy Garrett were neighbors uh, here for several decades. Um, in 1941, as Libby mentioned, Garrett contributed to the war effort by working at Douglas Aircraft in Santa Monica. He spent five years there in the engineering department. Next slide. After the war, uh, Garrett worked in a loose kind of partnership with Gregory Ain and the interracial nature of their uh, collaboration was really groundbreaking. Together, they designed this striking office building on Hyperion Boulevard in Silver Lake. Night, this is 1949. It's actually two buildings uh, on two lots. Garrett on the left and Ain on the right. They called themselves collaborators rather than partners, and they completed uh, at least 10 projects together. They also um, helped each other on other projects where they were um, uh, helping without credit. As Libby mentioned, I wrote a book about Gregory Ain, published in 2008, and that's where I uh, uh, learned uh, a little bit about uh, James Garrett. Next slide, please. The building pre presents a fairly blank uh, face to the street, but each side 
uh, has a wonderfully open uh, interior courtyard. And as you can see, it's uh, the buildings in rather marvelous original condition today. About this time, uh, uh, I mentioned earlier that that Garrett was the second African-American architect licensed in California. He was also the second African-American in the state to be admitted to the club, the AIA, American Institute of Architects. Um, and he did that uh, uh, in the 1940s. And his two sponsors were Gregory Ain and Paul Williams. So next slide, you can see a, a project by uh, Garrett and Ain. They were alternating uh, uh, Garrett and Ain, or Ain and Garrett, depending on who was uh, responsible for landing the client and who was the lead designer. So this was a Garrett project. His name came first, the Hamilton uh, Methodist Church, 1950. Not built, um, but would have been uh, spectacular. Uh, for an African-American congregation in South Los Angeles. Also a great look at Garrett's talents as an illustrator uh, in pen and ink uh, and in that very distinctive mid-century modern style. Next slide. As a team, Garrett and Ain went on to design a house for Ben Margolis in the Hollywood Hills, 1951. Margolis was a famous uh, kind of firebrand attorney, best known for defending the Hollywood 10 and the Sleepy Lagoon murder suspects. Ain probably designed the house, but he withdrew from the project. Not sure why, but possibly because of the Red Scare. Ain was being targeted by the FBI at this time as a suspected communist. Garrett, uh, apparently not in such danger. And so he became the architect uh, of record here. Full little photo by Julius Shulman and uh, what a beautiful uh, room. Next slide, please. Uh, Garrett and Ain in, in their collaboration, probably their best recognized work, at least for the general public, is the Westchester Municipal Building. Uh, this is 1958 to 60. And uh, a prominent site down on Manchester and Lincoln Boulevards. Again, Garrett's name was first here, so it was his job, and I, I think probably his most playful uh, design with the uh, uh, thin concrete uh, arches decorating the structure. It's in pretty original condition today, although they also designed uh, the library next door, which has been uh, changed considerably. Next slide, please. Now Garrett working uh, alone, as you see on the on the blueprint here uh, in the 1950s, and working very confidently in the mid-century modern style. This is the Friedman and Singer residence in Silver Lake, photo by Eric Brightwell. Uh, Burr Singer, uh, one of the clients here was a social realist painter. And although she was white, she was largely concerned uh, with black subject matter um, and, and fairly significant uh, for that. Next slide, please. Again, uh, Garrett working uh, with uh, sole credit here, the Firestone Sheriff Station of 1955. Garrett received nine major commissions from the Los Angeles County government during the 50s and 60s. This was considered, quote, the most modern law enforcement facility of its time. And Garrett at this time was profiled uh, in the Negro History Bulletin. And it was said, his approach to these assignments is not one of cold mechanical cost accounting, Rather, his consideration is people, their convenience, comfort, happiness, and well-being. Next slide, please. Here is Garrett at his most monumental, I think, the Carson Public Library of 1970. Um, uh, uh, perhaps his, his last 
a major project. <clears throat> Recently renovated, but still uh, in re relatively original condition, not changed uh, substantially. Uh, so go visit. It's uh, uh, even though this was a, a really, I think, large and complex job, Garrett always chose to keep his practice small. I'm not sure he ever had any full-time employees. So he really wanted to maintain uh, an autonomous control over his projects. <clears throat> Garrett's recently been described as a civil rights activist with a radical practice. I'm not sure about that characterization. Uh, he was not particularly politically active. He avoided uh, joining the kinds of groups that would be red listed. And there was nothing out of the ordinary about his practice other than his race. Um, the projects we just saw show that I think he was just a, a consummate mainstream professional architect delivering projects on time and on budget. <clears throat> um, he was described as a soft-spoken, thoughtful man. In a scholarly way, he told of his work, although obviously talking about himself was distasteful to him. How was Garrett so successful in gaining government jobs? Well, he was friends with Kenneth Hahn, the liberal, influential Los Angeles County supervisor who served South LA for uh, many decades. I was uh, delighted to find this picture of Kenny and Jimmy together. I don't think it's ever been seen before. This is at the Victoria Park Pool, 1967. And Ruth Garrett, pictured in the middle, she was called an indefatigable community worker. And she appeared from time to time in the society column in the California Eagle. The Garretts did not have any children, incidentally. All right, the last project I want to share with you is a, a little bit of a Easter egg for you. This is Garrett's only project uh, in Santa Monica. A dental office, 1948, for Dr. George Hurd. Uh, again, photo, photographed by Julia Schulman. Really just a quintessential mid-century modern professional building. It's on 9th Street, um, now south of the freeway. It's in very good condition. I believe the Santa Monica Conservancy is working to protect it. And uh, significantly, uh, Dr. Hurd was the only African-American dentist uh, on the west side. And like the uh, office building uh, we saw earlier, here too, the building presents a kind of blank face to the street, but opens inward uh, to a beautifully designed, uh, uh, protected uh, courtyard with tremendous transparency between indoors and outdoors. Again, just so characteristic of the mid-century modern style. I'll leave you with one last story. In 1970, and Garrett uh, and Ayn were in the twilight of their careers, they wrote an open letter to the American Institute of Architects, the AIA. It was about car traffic and air pollution in Los Angeles. They urged their fellow architects to plan buildings for public transportation rather than for automobiles. But more broadly, uh, they called on architects, and this is just a wonderful statement, I think, to quote, refuse to participate in any proposed building project that will predictably harm the environment anywhere. What a wonderful and prescient sentiment. It was the last publication uh, in Garrett's name. Uh, and he passed away in 1991. Well, thank you. And I'll turn it back uh, to Libby. Thank you, Tony. Excellent, excellent uh, sort of survey of, of Garrett's life. Thank you. Um, now, uh, certainly not not unimportant, but last is Paul Williams, one of Southern California's most recognized and respected architects, and the first African-American to join the prestigious American Institute of Architecture. 
Williams designed more than 3,000 mill properties, several in Santa Monica. In his nearly six decade career, his work ranged from lavish celebrity estates, iconic landmark buildings, to public housing and community churches, all spanning a variety of architectural styles. To offer his take on Paul Williams, we return to the expertise of Roland Wiley. Roland, please welcome back. Well, thank you, Libby, and I, and I say amen to everything you said. <laughs> Paul Williams was just an incredible architect and he was an incredible man. Um, it, this, this 12 minutes will not do any justice to the depth of his body of work the complexity of, of his life, but I'm gonna to try to give, give you guys a good overview of uh, Paul Revere Williams. Uh, he's born in 1894, thank you. Uh, he's born in 1894, his parents uh, from Memphis, Tennessee, Chester and Lila Williams. Uh, they moved uh, to Los Angeles in 1894. And um, both parents died of tuberculosis by the time Paul Williams was four, and he was adopted by the C.I. Carson family and lovingly raised. Now listen to this, 1894, he was born. In 1914, he was 20 years old. He was winning architectural design competitions at 20 years old with no real formal training and of course no degree. Married in 1917, he continued to win design awards, he literally had his family budget planning based on upcoming competitions that he knew he would win. Now that's just a very talented man. He uh, graduated from USC School of Engineering. He started his own practice in 1921. And by 1929, he was designing mansions for the stars. He's called architects to the stars. Listen to these, listen to these statistics. He, he executed over 2,500 projects from LA, to, to Bogota, Colombia. Uh, over three, he designed over 300 homes in the Beverly Hills Golden Triangles. He was an AIA Gold Medal Award that was uh, awarded to him after his death. Paul Revere Williams is definitely the gold standard for African American architects. I call him the Michael Jordan of African American architects. Next. Extraordinary is a word to describe Paul Williams' body of work. Uh, his handwriting, his handprint is literally over all of Beverly Hills and other communities. He, 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 he fought blatant racism and still thrived in his career. This is the Beverly Hills Hotel, the Crescent Wing, which he renovated in 1949 where you can see the Beverly Hills, that is his handwriting. And of course, next, Paul, Paul Williams was a master of both exterior and interiors. His interiors were very distinctive. This is the, the Paul Williams suite, uh, by the way, at the Beverly Hills Hotel. It was relocated, but maintained this design. Uh, his, his smooth curves, his, those gentle curved soffits and circular staircases are a trademark of, of Paul Williams' design. Next. Now, Paul Williams is described, you could describe his architectural style as creative eclecticism. He was, he was versatile in many, many styles, which you, which you will see right now. Architect to the stars, he, as he was known. This is the home of Lucy and Desi Arnett, built in 1954. Uh, it's a rambling mid-century modern. Um, again, the list of celebrities that uh, Paul Williams designed home for, homes for goes on and on. Next. This is the Frank Sinatra house in Beverly Hills, uh, Truesdale Estates. Uh, by the way, if I said that the previous uh, home, Lu Lucy and Desi Arnaz is in Palm Springs, I'm not sure if I got that correct, but this project is in Truesdale Estates in Beverly Hills. And it was built in 1956, another mid-century modern uh, home uh, for Frank, Frank Sinatra. And it was featured 
in a nationally televised uh, CBS program where Frank Sinatra walked, walked the whole country through his home. Unfortunately, this home was demolished in 2000 to make way for, you guessed it, a mega mansion in Beverly Hills. Next. This is the Lewis Cass residence, a Tudor revival, another style in Flint Ridge, which was built in 1921. Lewis Cass was actually Paul Williams' classmate at USC. And, and I guess Lewis heard that, that Paul Williams was making some noise in the residential <laughs> design field and he tracked him down and asked him to uh, design his home. Very fortunate client that uh, Paul Revere Williams had. Next. Uh, this is the Jay Paley house built in 1936, uh, the Georgian revival style with the, the very iconic Zodiac pool. Uh, again, this is one of the most beautiful pools in Los Angeles, I think. And uh, Paul Williams was very adept in his collaborations and in, in working with uh, different architectural styles. Next. Here we have a Santa Monica home. Uh, this is the LMA Warfield home built in 1939 in a Tudor revival style. Next. Another Hollywood elite, the Lon Chaney residence in Beverly Hills, uh, built in Italian revival style, uh, built in 1930. Unfortunately, Lon Chaney never was able to live in the home. He got very sick and I believe he passed away in 1930 and, and his wife, uh, did not want to move in, uh, but it's a very excellent example of Italian revival. Next. We have another Santa Monica home. Uh, there are a few homes uh, left in, in Santa Monica, in addition to a few commercial buildings that Paul uh, Williams designed in Santa Monica. This is the Tucker House, built in 1937, colonial revival, and also Tucker, Mr. Tucker was an African-American physician and also the, the contractor was Wince King, who was an African-American contractor who did quite a bit of work in, in Santa Monica. Next. Uh, this is the John Sweeney house today. It, it was originally the Blackburn house. I, I had the honor, uh, privilege of spending a little time in this house, so I really got to to know a Paul Williams home. Uh, it's a Spanish rambling, Spanish colonial revival uh, home built in 1927. Features multi-pane fixed windows, red clay tile roof, wrought iron uh, window grills and wood paneling, and, and of course the uh, vaulted and stenciled ceilings. But this, this building, this home, as large as it is, over 5,000 square feet, it's, the, it's typical Paul Williams style where it's scaled, the rooms are scaled for a human. The rooms are not overpowering the, and they flow. You progress from one room to the next and it's perfectly sighted with view vistas and natural light coming in at the right places. This is a very comfortable home. As large as it is, it's, it's a uniquely Paul Williams home. And I was very fortunate to be able to visit it. Next. Now here's an iconic photograph, a Julius Schumann um, uh, photograph of, uh, of Paul Williams in front of the, the theme tower. And this, this, this gets a lot of, of publicity. And ironically, he was not exactly the design lead. This was a, a team, next slide Pete, please. This was a team of architects, Charles Luckman, Welton Beckett, and I would, definitely imagine a very creative and innovative structural engineer. And that's what it takes. It takes teams to build these magnificent works of architecture and engineering. Next. Now, Paul Williams was a master architect. He executed commercial and institutional projects in addition uh, to the many homes that he designed. He was very active in the black community this project is the Golden State Mutual Building, the second uh, building that previously was, uh, the first building was designed by James Garrett, which we just found out about. Very active in the black community, very conscious next of who he was as a black man. 
The Golden State Mutual Building was built in 1949, and it was renovated and expanded uh, in around 20, 2016 uh, by the Southern California Los Angeles Regional Center. It features a very nice fountain. In, in, the, in the rear, you can see the expansion, but the connection to the two buildings, there's a fountain that, that honors Paul Williams. Next. He also designed churches. First AME was designed in 1965. And the groundbreaking was, it was really, I, I just read about it. Uh, Tony Curtis and Marlon Brando were present with the shovels for the, the groundbreaking. And Paul Williams donated his design of the, the first AME church. And it is an iconic church where that is the gathering place for all uh, political activities in the African-American community. Although that is changing with the death of, of Chip Murray, who was the pastor and he passed away this year. Next, the Al Jolson Shrine in 1951. Again, uh, Paul Williams had a, a range <laughs> of projects. His range was, was just incredible. Next. Now, I want to go back to mention that Paul Williams was uh, very conscious of his status as a Black man. Uh, he, he devoted much of his time in the community. Uh, he wrote an essay called I Am a Negro, and I, I highly recommend that you read that. And in one of his the quotes in that essay, he says, I came to realize that I was being condemned, not by my lack of ability, but by my color. I found in my condition an incentive to personal accomplishment and inspiring challenge. Without having the wish to show them, I developed a fierce desire to show myself. That was Paul Williams. And I, that was a very strong factor, I believe, in motivating him to achieve what he achieved. He devoted much of his time developing concepts for affordable housing. He had a keen understanding of the needs of the people. Next. Uh, Paul Williams was appointed to the National Board of Municipal Housing in 1940. That is a national appointment. And he, as I mentioned, he spent a lot of time developing concepts for affordable housing. This is an example of a, a prototype for a home he published in his pattern book called New Homes for Today for post-war affordable housing in the 1940s. Next. He also designed Nickerson Gardens in, in South Los Angeles. Next. Now, Paul Revere Williams was revered by his peers. Uh, his, the, the generation of African-Americans below him absolutely looked up to him. This was a, a um, honor, honorary dinner for Paul Williams, I believe was in the, it, I'm, of course it was in the mid 1970s, but there are several architects that I know uh, in this, this photograph. Next. Now, many of you may be wondering, how did he do it? How was he able to achieve that body of work? How was he able to execute that level of excellence? How was he able to deal with the blatant racism and the rejection that he experienced on a day-to-day -day basis. And we talk about, those of you who may know the, the history of Paul Williams, talk about how he had to teach himself to draw upside down so as not to offend his white clients and how he was just such a gracious man, how he designed homes that he could not live in that neighborhood and probably should not be there after dark. How did he, how did he deal with that? That, that question just stays with me. Next. I think the answer is the love of his family. That was his balance. He had his family as his sanctuary. He had his family that he could go to for unconditional love that's protected from all of the racism and all of the Jim Crow and all, all of that, that those problems that our society face blatantly today and, and not so blatantly, <laughs> blatantly back then, not so blatantly today, but it's still there. And that's what he was able to do that I believe. Next, 
This is his, his family, his two daughters and his wife. And, you know, I could just see him right now on a Sunday evening, chilling in his backyard uh, with his grandkids and his kids and just enjoying life and enjoying the success that he has, but also recognizing that family is most important. And he will get that love and that, that re respect and acceptance unconditionally from his family. And I think that Paul Williams was this, this talent, tenacity, grace, and vision. Thank you very much. Back to you, Libby. Thank you very much, Roland. Uh, and now it's time to give our audience an opportunity to ask our panel of esteemed experts their questions. And uh, I think the first question we have, as Roland, has to do with uh, uh, Paul Williams' family. Um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about his granddaughter, Karen Hudson, who's uh, written a book about her grandfather. And I just wonder, I think he she lives in his house in... Uh, Lafayette Park. Is that correct? Well, the first of all, his family, I, I think that that is the key. And I do know Karen and her brother, Paul, very good people. I mean, consistently good people, which which reinforces my thought that Paul Williams spent a lot of time with his family. He spent a lot of time just loving his family and influencing his family. And Karen Hudson I did live in the house in, in Lafayette Square for quite a while. And I believe it was recently sold, very, very recently. I, I'm not sure who the buyer is, uh, but that's what I think the status is. Also, speaking of his houses, apparently his first house uh, was yeah. not, it was in a neighborhood that uh, he couldn't live in other neighborhoods where his clients were. And I guess it's been uh, given a cultural historic designation and it has been lovingly is being lovingly um remodeled which is yeah. you're absolutely right Libby and that's one of the great things that we are now becoming aware of Paul Williams and his accomplishments and how important his history is because that house was just there for a long time it could have easily been taken down and torn turned into a you know a fourplex or something yes. but it has been purchased by uh, someone who really appreciates Paul Williams' legacy and history. And I'm certainly looking forward to its, its total restoration. Uh, the next question is for you, um, Tony. Um, somebody wonders if Garrett was, was influenced as AIM was in interior flexibility, in movable walls and opening rooms if necessary to provide either more living space or more bedroom space? Or is that just a random thought? No, I think that that is all certainly part of the, the kind of ethos of mid-century modern architecture and and part of the, the, the mid-century mid period. Um, I mentioned that um, um, it's believed Garrett designed uh, some schools in Los Angeles, um, yet to be uncovered. But um, certainly, flexible space was um, was a very common theme in in school architecture uh, in that period. Churches uh, as well, um, and 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 private homes uh, as well. So yeah, certainly, um, flexible space. Uh, was and and kind of um, movement transparency of movement uh, in in homes and other buildings, um, yeah, a, a real strength of of Garrett as a designer. Uh, one more for you quickly. Uh, it's a, it's noted that he did not have any formal training. And first of all, I wonder if the how 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 from the how common is that these days that you don't go through, you know, the graduate architecture school and all of that stuff. And uh, another um, another of our uh, writers asked uh, if he gained some skills training uh, from watching his father work on and construction buildings. His father constructed buildings in, Al in Alabama, such as Tuskegee Institute near Montgomery. Um, this person goes on to say, um, 
was uh, his uncle was Alva Garrett, a dentist who was founder of the Los Angeles Urban League, and his uncle was politically active in L.A. Hence why Jimmy Garrett might have been in the mix of Black and Los Angeles politics and why he became associated with Hahn, who was on the L.A. City Council before he became an L.A. supervisor. Anyway, that's comments from uh, one of our... Um, sure, and uh, uh, um, another uncle, Homer, so it, it's James Homer Garrett, right? So he uh, his middle name was taken from his other uncle. So Homer Garrett um, was the first Black detective in the Los Angeles Police Department. Oh. Um, so they, yeah, there was they they were were a, a very, I think, successful family in in terms of uh, public affairs in in the city. Um, yes, that the, the 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 question is correct that that Garrett uh, was born in Alabama and his father was uh, a builder there, and so I, I think Jimmy was raised on construction sites and worked uh, uh, on them as a teenager um, and then came to Los Angeles, I believe, during his sort of teenager high school years. Um, and I mentioned his attendance at, at um, L.A. Polytechnic High School, which I think we're just beginning to understand that that was actually a rather extraordinary place uh, at that time. <clears throat> Um, and, and I think you asked if if it would be unheard of uh, today to be licensed as an architect without yeah. university training. Yeah, I think I think it's actually impossible these days. Yeah, uh, that that having an accredited degree is uh, is prerequisite to licensure. But no, he he was able to pass the examinations um, by self study. <laughs> Uh, this one apparently would be for Roland. Roland did uh, Norma's um, firm with Siegel and Diamond continue, and is it still a viable firm today? Uh, it did. I'm not sure how long it continued after Norma, but I I do know that it's it's no longer uh, in existence today. Kate Diamond is like chief architect for HDR Architects. She's way up there, you know. Oh. In the in the the chain of command for HDR, and that's a very large uh, national uh, architecture and engineering firm. And I do not believe that Margot Siegel is is with us anymore. Uh, what about Paul Williams? Did his firm uh, is there still a Paul Williams? Uh... You know, that's it. Thank you for asking that that question, Libby. It is extremely difficult for any architecture firm to move forward with the next generation, but it is particularly tough for African-American firms to, to extend into the next generation. And, and that's just, that's part of the, of the systemic challenges that, that we have as African-American architects. Back when Paul Williams got, well, after in the, in the 50s, 60s, the percentage of licensed African-American architects was 2%. Now, 2025, that percentage is 2.2%. Oh, we are not moving the needle. And there are there are ways to move the needle. We are we are uh, we have a pipeline project. National Organization of Minority Architects has a project pipeline that brings kids gets kids interested in architecture. At the same time, the question is: once they get interested in architecture, go to architecture school, graduate, how are they promoted up? through the system so that they can be a principal at a firm or own their own firm. That I believe is, is the challenge. And that I believe is, is where we really need to work. I see. Um, this one is for Anne Wallentine. And it, the, the Brunson design for the city hall uh, to one of our uh, questioners has a kind of a Mayan uh, uh, vibe. Do you have anything to say about that? Yeah, I think that's interesting that they they see that in there. Um, I'd have to look a little bit closer to see if there's some of those mo like more patterned motifs in, but I do think that some of the elevation he's getting with the sort of central tower is could be drawn from a lot of different traditions. Um, so yeah, I think there's it's interesting how many different references and inspirations that Vernon Brunson was looking to, um, certainly among local architects, like what we've talked about, um, the others 
that um, that we've heard about today, like Paul R. Williams, um, but also just broad global traditions. We know from Vernon Brunson's writings that he was really interested in global politics as well from his articles in the California Eagle. So certainly could have been drawing from a lot of different um, influences like that, yeah. Uh, speaking of these influences, um, did, did this is for all of you, did these uh, uh, esteemed architects travel and did they catch, catch uh, ideas and inspirations from other um, countries, other architects, other traditions? Well, Jimmy Garrett loved uh, uh, Yosemite and camping and traveling in, in the California uh, landscape. He, uh, he, um, uh, there's, there's very little written up about Garrett and nothing written by Garrett. So, um, he's a little bit of a blank slate, but what, but one article said that he was dreaming of, of visiting, uh, Europe. Um, I don't know if he ever made that happen. <clears throat> One last question. This has to do with a perhaps a partnership with uh, landscape architects. Did any of these architects work with landscapers? The uh, one thing I do know about Paul Williams that was his first, very first job was with a landscape architect. I, I forgot the the gentleman's name, but that was his very first job, and I, I think it was for a couple of years with the landscape architect. I have in my reading and research, I have not discovered a strong link uh, with Paul Williams and any particular landscape architect. I see, I see. Uh, you think of the mid-century often to be associated with some of the well-known landscapers. Uh, one quick question, I'm sorry, I have one more here. The photos of the Beverly Hills Hotel impress me. Bold, unadorned shapes. I especially like the sinuous line on the ceiling of the Paul mm -hmm. Williams room. Did Williams and Garrett have a way, more freedom to push the envelope in, in usually stayed buildings like hotels? <laughs> that's, a, that's an interesting question. I, I'll, I'll try to answer it for Paul Williams. Um, Paul Williams had a, a very restrained yet elegant style. His That's what was so it, it kind of matched his personality that he wanted to uh, exude a, a, a sense of, of grandeur, but not overly stated, not where it's intimidating to the common man. And so his, what I, I, I mentioned his curves were gentle and they, they just move with you. I think his, his style was, was definitely uh, restrained and, and orderly. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that Paul Williams was uh, trying to push the envelope. I think he was taking what, what what he was given with in terms of all these styles that he became so adept in, and he just put his signature on all of them. That that's how I think Paul Williams worked. Thank you. Um, I want to thank the speakers, all of you, and the audience. Great questions, one and all. Uh, and now we're turning our program over to the leadership, uh, beginning with Rob Schwenker, who is the executive director of the Santa Monica History Museum, uh, our mosaic partner. I take it away, Rob. Thank you. Thank you so much, Libby. Uh, thank you, Roland Wiley. Thank you, Tony Denzer. Uh, thank you to uh, my friends, colleagues, and collaborators, Carolyn Edwards and Ann Wallentine. Uh, as well as Libby Motika, Steve Loper, uh, Caitlin Drisco, Catherine Azimi, uh, everyone uh, over at the Santa Monica Conservancy um, for this wonderful program this evening. Uh, for, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Rob Schwenker. I'm the executive director of the Santa Monica History Museum. We are proud collaborators here um, on Mosaic. And I, I wanted to talk to you a little bit tonight about uh, support um, of organizations uh, like ours um, that do the important work of, uh, of telling the stories um, in our community. You know, at the Santa Monica History Museum, it's really important that we tell the stories of everyone in our community. Um, it's one of the many reasons why uh, the Quinn Gallery, um, which, uh, which allows uh, the work of the Quinn Research Center uh, and Carolyn and Bill Edwards uh, to be on display uh, all year round, uh, and and for and for all time um, is a really important part of what we do. 
at the Santa Monica History Museum. Um, if you are a, a member of the Santa Monica Conservancy, you ought to be a member of the Santa Monica History Museum. Uh, and if you're a member of the Santa Monica History Museum, you ought to be a member of the Santa Monica Conservancy. It's a really easy uh, way for individuals uh, to support this important work in preservation um, that we're doing. If you're interested in that, you can go to our website, santamonicahistory.org. Um, we are building a community of members. We just had a, a, our first membership event, which was really successful. Um, if you like uh, what you heard from Ann Wallentine, we have all sorts of special opportunities to sort of access uh, what we do at the History Museum behind the scenes and get a little bit of a deeper look um, into our work and, and what we exhibit. So I invite you to join our community of members. Um, a really fun way uh, next slide, please. A really fun way to get involved in the Santa Monica History Museum uh, is to come out uh, to our annual fundraising event. We really try to put the fun uh, in fundraising, um, and we do that uh, by making it uh, an amazing food event and a really fun entertainment experience. So uh, we uh, are partnering with um, someone who I'm sure you all know, uh, celebrity chef and James Beard Award winner, Mary Sue Milliken, on a wonderful food program. Um, one of the other chefs that we know will join us at this event is uh, Bryant Nin of Cassia. Um, and uh, so you'll enjoy wonderful food, a uh, great cocktail program curated by Mary Sue Milliken and Sokolo. Um, and you get to honor uh, Community Corporation of Santa Monica, which is, of course, uh, the largest provider of affordable housing in our community. And that's that's really in keeping with um, our uh, our main exhibition this year, which is on housing. It's called Unhoused, the History of Housing in Santa Monica. And we hope that by taking a look at where we've been, uh, we can understand uh, perhaps the most important issue facing all of us as Angelinos, housing. Uh, and we, we might imagine where we go. Um, we're going to have a, a whole slate of programming that you can watch um, our social media channels for more information on or go to our website to learn more about um, that will explore this really important topic of housing. Of course, come on in um, and take a look um, at our housing exhibition, as well as uh, the work that we have displayed in the Quinn Gallery, which is all about um, the amazing life and legacy of Vernon Brunson, who uh, we were privileged enough to hear, hear about tonight. Um, the other thing that happens uh, at Stand Up for History um, is uh, that you're you're treated to a really fun show. Um, it's funny. It's heartwarming. It's engaging. Uh, it's not filled with uh, a lot of dry speeches. Uh, we're here to to feed you um, and 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 let you have fun uh, and and entertain you. It's a really fun night and a great way to support your. History Museum, Saturday, Sunday, September 29th uh, at the Santa Monica Bay Women's Club. We hope you can join us. Um, go to that link uh, that's right there uh, on the page uh, or just go to santamonicahistory.org and you can click uh, right on through to that event. I hope to see you there. Uh, looking forward to seeing you all uh, at the next Mosaic program. Uh, again, thank you so much. Uh, for having us. And I'd like to introduce the executive director of uh, the Santa Monica Conservancy. Please welcome Kaylin Driscoll. Thank you, Rob. Um, thank you so much to everyone. First, I want to thank all of our presenters for your generosity of spirit in sharing what are clearly your passionate interests. You've done remarkable research and professional work to bring these stories to life for us. This is an important topic and uh, was really well presented tonight. We appreciate your work. Thank you again. And a special thank you to those who put this program together for us. Rob referred to a few of them, Libby Motika and Steve Loper, our producers, and Adina Bernheimer, who worked together to conceptualize, create, and produce the Mosaic series. Thank you so much. Um, and last but not least, we want to also thank uh, and take this time to recognize again our sponsor, BXP, Boston Properties, for their support of this program. And 
while you've heard much about the Santa Monica History Museum, who, who have a collection and an exhibit, one of the things the Santa Monica Conservancy really focuses on is in-person experiences. So here at the Santa Monica Conservancy, we promote the preservation of important places and cultural heritage in, in producing in-person experiences in addition to our virtual presentations like tonight's mosaic. Please come out and visit the Annenberg Community Beach House. We have docents there four days a week that can show you a glimpse of what history looked like when Marion Davies and William Randolph Hearst lived in Santa Monica. We also have the downtown walking tours. We offer those two Saturdays a month. You can go to our website and sign up for those and our Preservation Resource Center at the Shotgun House. This summer, in fact, we're increasing our programming at the Shotgun House. So come and discover the best kept secret, a little shotgun house built in 1897. And it's we're, we're promoting it as our Heritage Community Center for Ocean Park. We'll have docent-led weekend tours two weekends a month for the, through the summer. And we've included a new Main Street Walk and open houses on summer evenings. So please go to our website to hear about all these activities and uh, join us at the Little Shotgun House. And we can't do this without you. We're looking for storytellers. All these in-person experiences need people who really want to share the history of Santa Monica. We're looking, uh, as you've heard tonight, it's so important for visitors to hear and learn from those who are passionate about history. Please consider joining us as a volunteer to share stories about the history of Santa Monica. And last but not least, it is only through your generous donations and your memberships that we can continue doing these programs. So give, your, give our historic places a voice and support the Santa Monica Conservancy and donate to make sure we continue offering programs, tours, and become a member so you can hear about all the things we're doing uh, in the community to advance our mission as the leading voice of heritage conservation through advocacy, community engagement, education, and partnerships in a broad effort to discover and preserve the significant places in our community. So I wanna thank everyone again so much. And along with my partner at the Santa Monica History Museum, I wanna thank you all for joining us tonight.